Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The text of our sermon this morning is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, reading from chapter 4. Paul says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This is the word of the Lord. What change are you ready for this year? There are three areas uh, that I'd like to see some change. First is personal. There are some things that I think about in my life that I would like to change. I haven't made a resolution uh, seeking this change, but there are some things I'd like to do differently. There's probably some people who would like me to do them differently as well. Change in church. I'd like to see some things different. Not because there's a, a glaring issue or glaring problem, but a recognition that new opportunities arise, situations that present uh, opportunities to proclaim the gospel, and so we would like to see some changes there. And of course, change in our world. And we could go on and on and on about all the things we would like to see changed. I don't think I'm alone. I think those three areas are kind of common to people today, especially Christians, as we evaluate our life and our congregational life and our Christian life in this world, to see some change. But none of us are so naive as to think the change from 21 to 22 means that everything's going to be great. Everything's just going to automatically go the way we plan it or the way we think it should go. We can look at history and realize it's not the case. Our own history. We've been through this before, thinking about change in our own life, and somehow it doesn't go the way we had planned. In church, in our country, we know that history teaches us that things don't change. A couple months ago, we were doing a Bible study on Sunday morning on the Old Testament book of Judges. And and the very premise of that book is, God's people just didn't change. The same problems kept coming back. That's not just true of Old Testament Israel. It's true of God's people today. But when you get to the end of a year and you start a new year, think about it. Think about change. Think about some of the temptations to maybe avoid a unrealistic optimism that says, everything's just going to be great because I thought about it or I planned for it. Or this poisonous pessimism that says, nothing's going to change. It's always the same. That's not true either. We know that God's word is powerful. We know that God's word works change. The Apostle Paul is a great example of that. The persecutor of the church who became the missionary for the church. But we also recognize that when we talk about change, we need to do it in the lens of God's Word. And we learn some things from God's Word. Things we really already know, things we've learned in the past, and things that will be with us in the future. But our God's the same. He's the same old God we've always had. And that's good news as we consider our life personally and our church life and our life in this world going into a new year. We can expect the same things from our God next year. The same powerful gospel and the same blessing of living daily in His grace. And we will consider that thought as we Study these verses from St. Paul to the Galatians this morning. It's a good place to talk about change. 
it's important for us to understand a little bit about the congregations that Paul was writing to and some of the challenges they were facing. These Galatian churches, and there are a number of congregations that Paul was writing to, were churches that he started on his first mission trip in the area of modern-day Turkey. Congregations in Lystra and Derby and Iconium and Antioch. Paul had gone into those cities, and the first thing he did was to find the synagogue or the gathering of Jews in that city. And he would show those Jews from the Old Testament how Jesus was a fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Messiah. And some of them believed, some of them became Christian, not all of them did. And then Paul would move on. He would start preaching to the Gentiles. Those people who were not Jews, who didn't know the Old Testament, and he would talk to them about the commonality they had, their sin and their need for forgiveness. And so these early Christian congregations developed around Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Great change had happened for those Jewish Christians. Their whole life, hundreds of years of their worship life, revolved around sacrifice and ritual that was repeated over and over, but it all pointed to Christ, and when he came, that was set aside. Now they had the reality that all of those sacrifices pointed to. That was a big change. One of the temptations that those people faced was to go back. To go back to that Old Testament law and to impose that law on the Gentile Christians. That's what had happened in these congregations. Paul got word, some very disturbing word, that these Gentile Christians were turning back to Old Testament law. He spoke in this letter in some very strong ways. Very early on, he said to the people, he said, I can't believe you're so quickly abandoning the gospel. You're so foolish. He said, if you do this, if you continue in this way and go back under that law, you're cutting yourself off from Christ. You're falling away from the faith. This is deadly serious for their spiritual life. And so Paul writes this letter to address that problem. They needed to change. In order to change, Paul took them back to what God had done for them. Paul took them back to the power of the gospel that had changed them. Listen again to the first couple verses of our text. Paul says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Other translations have this verse 4, when the time had fully come. When the set time had, had come. And we think about God's timing. And, and sure, it's perfect. But I wonder if Mary and Joseph thought it was so perfect when they traveled 75 miles while Mary was nine months pregnant. And they get to Bethlehem and there was no room for them in the inn. I wonder if they thought this timing doesn't seem so good. Or when Jesus was born, the king reigning at that time was named Herod. He was a murderous king who tried to kill Jesus by killing all the babies in Bethlehem. That doesn't seem like the best time to bring the Savior into the world or the best place. But we know how it all worked out. We, we know what God did and we know why this was the right time. But there's something even more here. Of course God's timing is always right. And we believe that by faith, but we don't always see it. In these verses, Paul gives us something more. He reminds us of the power of the gospel. God sent his son, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Not because of anything we had done or this world had done. In spite of our sin, God sent Jesus, born of a woman, born just like us, a real human being. 
without any sin. And he put himself under his law. Born under the law so that he could obey it for us. And for all the people who have ever lived, all those Old Testament Jews who were living under that law, God sent his son to live for them. Redeem them. As Pastor Schoen shared with the children, not with five dollars. His holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. And the result? We're heirs. Heirs of heaven. That's the power of the gospel. And that gospel came to each of us personally when God called us to faith, when we were baptized, or the first time we heard about Jesus as our Savior, that change took place in us. We were redeemed personally from sin, death, and hell. We were purchased by the blood of Christ and given that inheritance of eternal life in heaven. The gift of God's grace. What a powerful message, a powerful truth of the scriptures. Why would anybody ever want to go away from that? There's a, another theme in this book of the Galatians. Paul talks about freedom. Chapter 5, he says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't go back to the law. And we look at this and say, why would those people want that? Why would they want that law? They had to keep doing it over and over again. There was no end. We wouldn't do that. It doesn't make any sense at all. When we think about change, change in our own life, we could probably come up with a pretty long list. Not that we're going to share with anybody in our own mind. The last couple of years have given people in general opportunity to reflect more, I think. When you're alone or not able to do the things you want to do, you, you reflect on your life. See, there's a lot to change. But we also think about other people, too, and the changes they need to make, changes we want them to make. Which gets more of your attention? The personal or those other people? Think about this a little bit. I'll just share a personal thing. As a pastor, there's a lot of changes I'd like to see. But in reality, I know very little about your personal situations. But I'd like to see a number of things as, as people in this world, there's a lot of stuff we would like to see different out there. But we know very little about what God is doing and how God is working everything. We know it's happening, but we just need these changes. And what happens is we begin to focus more on other people and what they need to do in order to make us happy or to make our life easier when we forget about the changes in themselves. There's a lot of different ways to consider this, but maybe this is helpful. Is the change we're looking for something that will bring glory to God or something that will just make our life more comfortable or easier or remove a problem? And we don't have to think about it too much to realize that a lot of what we want to happen doesn't really involve us. It's about other people. There's a lot of things that need to change in our own hearts, in our own lives. One thing that will not change is God's powerful work. Gospel. Same old God in 2022. Same old God who calls us to repentance and faith. Who assures us 
that our sins have been washed away and that change has taken place in our heart for now and for eternity. That will be there next year because that's God's promise to us. These very familiar sections of Scripture, the set time, God sent his son, born to redeem us, that we might become children of God. That will be true next year, just as it's always been true. And God will give us that truth the same way he's always given it to us, through his word and sacraments. Same message, same gospel power, and the same blessed result for the child of God. A life lived in God's grace. We're not living under that law. We don't want to put people under that law. We have this beautiful freedom in Christ. We stand in this grace that assures us that we are at peace every day of our life and for all eternity. That'll be the same going forward. And therefore, we'll have a glorious life. Paul describes that again in the verses of our text. He says, because you're his sons. And when he's talking about son, it's not a gender thing. He's talking about the, the, the heir, the, the, the inheritance that comes. And each of us have that. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. The Old Testament Jews who lived under that law still had God's grace. The Old Testament is a, a continuing example of God's grace to his people who, who went in the other direction, but God always brought them back and God always kept his promise. But they were still minor children. They weren't full-grown adults. They were living under the supervision of the law. And the purpose of that law was to lead them to Christ. And when he came, the law was gone. The full rights of sons was theirs by trusting in Jesus. They had everything. That's what we have. We have full rights. We have the inheritance. Heaven is ours right now. And how do we see that in the midst of all the things that need to change in our lives, in our families, in our workplace, in our world? We see it through the Spirit who gave it to us. Who Jesus gave to us. The Spirit who is in you. Who dwells in your heart because you're a child of God. All of those powerful gospel promises assure you that the Holy Spirit is in you. And Paul describes what he does. The Holy Spirit who, who longs to speak to the Father. The Holy Spirit says, Abba, Father. He knows God listens and knows God answers those prayers. The Holy Spirit who assures us of our inheritance. No matter what we've done, no matter what changes we failed to make again this year, we're dearly loved, forgiven children of God. And the Holy Spirit through baptism and through the Lord's Supper and through his powerful word assures us that we stand and live in that grace. We don't need any changes. We need the same old God and the same promises that have always been there. And that really sets us free. It really sets us free to, to think honestly about our own life and what changes to make. We don't get so controlled about what other people need to do or need to stop doing. About a year ago, I was taking an online class on addiction counseling. And uh, the class read a lot of different books on, on different counseling methods, some written by secular people and, and some by, by pastors and, and religious leaders. And there was one book I read, and a pastor who wrote the book told a story uh, about a a member of his congregation that came to him for some marriage counseling. And she really didn't want counseling. She just wanted authorization to get divorced. She said, I'm done. And she had reason. Her husband was doing some things he shouldn't be doing. And he listened to her and acknowledged, yeah, some changes need to happen. 
So then he challenged her, said, why don't you make some changes first? Before we give up on this marriage, why don't you make some changes? Live in love and forgiveness and service. And don't let your love and forgiveness and service be dependent upon what somebody does or doesn't do. Just live the life God has called you to. So she left, tried it, she made a big change. Came back, no longer wanting divorce, and said, I think it's going to work out. Something changed. Her own heart and life and her husband's. Still had challenges and still had issues, but that realization came, hey, I need to make some change too. When we live by the power of the gospel, when we live in the grace of God that is ours no matter what's going on around, and that's the way, and that's the life God has given us, we really don't want that to change. We want that same gospel and that same grace. And we have it. So whatever the next year brings, whatever cross God has in mind for us, as we sang right before the sermon this morning, we got the same God. And he's not going to change. And that's his promise to us. In the book of Malachi, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Israel, are not destroyed. The word of the Lord abides forever. Same God going to the next year. Same gospel power, same life in his grace. It's going to be a good year. It's going to be a joyful year. Because our God is going to be with us. Just as he always has. Amen.